Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equate Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, Kara St. Louis returns to the show. Kara shares her research and insights into the theory of whether the sun is our true source of food and nutrition. And to kick the show off, Kara talks to us about her upcoming online lecture, Taste Buds, The Great Food Con, which is scheduled for Saturday, February 16th, 2019, from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For more information about the lecture and to obtain tickets, please click the link in the description box below. And so without further ado, here's the conversation with Kara. Well, folks, we're going to have a great show today. Kara St. Louis is back with us, and Kara is a good friend, and we go back a long ways. And uh, every once in a while, we catch up, and we just have our conversations. And we're going to spend uh, a good portion of the show, I would guess, on a new book that Kara is going to release called, is it Taste Buds, Kara? It's called The Great Food Food Con, a.k.a. Taste Buds. Okay, gotcha. Okay. It's a long title. All righty. <laughs> and, uh, and you're up in the uh, the north, northeast these days, and it's very cold there, yes? <laughs> yes, Mike. It's, I am in Maine right now, and we've just gone through a weekend, which I'm remembering now is fairly typical for this part of the world. Um, I had been away from this for about six years when I was in London, which is cold and wet, but uh, it doesn't snow. And when you want to get from point A to point B, you get on the tube or you get on a bus or you walk or whatever. This is this is a real shock to my system. I have to say we've had, uh, well, the whole northeastern United States has had this ice slash snow slash whatever. And I'll tell you, I walked into this house. I've got this little house. I'm lucky enough to be renting. I live here now with my daughter. And uh I walked down in the basement and I saw an oil tank. Man, my heart hit the floor with a thud. I was like, no, Mm -hmm. are you freaking kidding me? I'm back to oil. It's expensive. I'm spending like 400 bucks a month keeping oil in that tank. Can you imagine? I can't imagine because we had that when I lived on Long Island many years ago. And I remember even back then, it was very expensive to heat the house with oil. Yeah, and I'm missing my wood-burning stove. That's That was the difference. You have a wood-burning stove, which most people do in Maine. Maine is about a combination of wood and oil. Very, very little house on the prairie up here still, which is great in many, many ways. But in the winter, it's dangerous, downright dangerous. Um, there's a lot of ice and, and, and that kind of stuff. But, um, and also I have to say, I'm probably going to get every Mainer I know is probably going to be mad at me in a second, but there's a real macho, you know, uh, about driving in the snow up here. Uh, That's how you, that's how they gauge you as, uh, to the size of your, you know, what (laughs) is how you feel about driving in the snow. I actually had someone say to me, ah, yeah, when it snows, you got to drive it like you stole it. Yeah. What? Yeah. But yeah, that's that's their whole sort of swagger about driving in the snow up here. And I'm thinking, you know what? I have kids who still need me, whom I love. <laughs> yeah. I'm not ready to die, dude. Anyway, so it's always it's anyway, the point being I miss my wood burning stove because a wood burning stove you can cook on. If everything goes to hell in a handbasket around you, you just huddle up around the wood burning stove. Right. Right. And you're warm. People die up here when the heat goes, when the electricity goes out, as they do in many, many places. I'm not saying it's just me, but yeah, it's been a hellacious weekend and I'm super, super glad to have gotten to the end of it so I can talk to Mike. I just dug some of my car out. I was on, I have to tell you, uh, last night was it? I don't know. I was on Facebook with a friend who had just come to me and said she had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And did she want it? Because they know that I've just been through this thing with my eyes and it was nutritional. And I did some Chinese things and my eyes are, you know, I no longer have the issue. So she came to me and asked me to talk about it and stuff. And the split second we started getting into it, I realized that there was water pouring through my kitchen ceiling. Uh. So I know, right? Maine, hey, in the winter, right? <laughs> Woo! So I had to go deal with that. Freaked myself. Uh, anyway, whatever. I don't care. I'm here. I We prevailed. Mike is on the other end, as he always is. He's one of my most dependable friends in this community. 
And so there he is. And here I am. And we're going to talk about my my new book, which comes actually with I've been threatening to write for a very long time. And uh, it comes with a lecture that I'm doing online in a couple of weeks, February 16th. I'm doing the lecture part of this because last year, this time of year, I did a private invitation only lecture on the Fay to kind of float that out there and see how people were like, you know, were responding to the information and, you know, that kind of thing. And so I invited the people I trusted <laughs> to come and listen to what I had to say. And that worked out really nicely. So I think from now on, Mike, I'm going to do a winter lecture in January online because that's the only way you can get people's attention. Yep. You can't, they will not show up with their bodies in seats anymore. They will not, which is a big shame because there is nothing like talking in front of a, of a room full of beating hearts. Yep. Nothing, nothing. And I will try to do that once a year if I can. That's just not easy. Um, anyway, so this will be my winter lecture this year. The subject or the title of this book is, as we just said, um, the great food con colon, aka, taste buds, something I've been thinking about for a very long time. It is connected to everything that we've been talking about and doing, going all the way back to chemtrails and the sun thief. One of the things that I've always said is the reason I got involved in that as deeply as I did is because it was so clear right off the bat that it was an esoteric crime of the highest order to get between us and the sun. And I just had to know what the hell was going on with that. And I just get it gets crazier and crazier and crazier. But it makes more and more sense as I get into this food issue that all they have to do is tur is turn off our food, which is the sun. And when they turn off our food, they turn off the earth's food. They turn off. I mean, it's it's of course, of course, this is what they want to do. Bill Gates is getting involved. I can't even tell you how I feel about that. Who gave Bill Gates permission to do that? Is he the emperor of the universe or something that he could just go do that? Does he not have to ask permission before he flies around in the in the plasma doing more destruction? Does anybody ask these questions anymore, Mike? No, no. They take guys like Bill Gates. If you see how they do it, what they do is they prop them up first as this friendly face. In other words, he was the uh, the person behind Windows, the operating system, and how wonderful that is, and so on. And so they, they build it up so that he becomes, quote unquote, trusted. Then they move him into another piece of the matrix. And then he starts to talk about that aspect of it. It has nothing to do with Windows or operating systems or computers anymore, right? Right. And so people are now conditioned to look at Bill Gates and think that he's the voice of reason, that he is some kind of an authority. People feel like they have an affinity for him because they think they know him because of the marketing that's been done to put him out there. Right. So who's given him authority? Nobody's given him authority. People basically just, they just accepted it based upon the conditioning that was put out beforehand. Because this is a very um, topical subject, the book goes to a lot of things that, that we've been talking about for a long time. There will be tangents. There should be tangents. And we'll talk about those. <laughs> anyway, by the time this book comes out, which I'm hoping will be in about two weeks, several, several, half a dozen, maybe less than half a dozen talk show hosts, the people I actually trust will have either copies of the PDF or they will have copies of the book. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm sick and tired of people ripping me off. And they're going to. As soon as Mike and I finish this lecture, somebody will have something out in 48 hours just based on what I say. OK, I've made my peace with that. It may not sound like it, but I have. I've made my peace with that. What I have learned is that people have copies of my book or they have explanations on their shows. And there it is. And that's all I really care about. So on with the book. So let's talk about I did give him I did give him an outline, which I'm actually going to refer to because why? Because it's a big subject. It's a bit unwieldy because it goes to so many different places. Ask yourself what we were supposed to be to begin with. This goes to my work on the Fay. This goes to my work on the seed race. In the beginning, what was that, right? I have information that there was an entity involved in midwifing us. Well, that shouldn't be hard for anybody to get a hold of because one way or the other, we believe in an entity that birthed us. 
that gave us life or whatever. We even believe in the Big Bang, which I'm going to talk about later, too. Well, we got here somehow, right? Somehow we got here. Let's <laughs> yeah. say somehow we got here. And I would I would venture to say that when we got here, we were in mint condition, still in the box. Nothing wrong with us. That's I would I would postulate that. OK, then some as gradually over time. We lost our sovereignty. We lost our ability to maintain our integrity esoterically, emotionally, psychologically, physically. All of those things was eroded, 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 eroded outside sources. OK, so what happened? Well, I'm looking at a situation where in um, the next book called I'm Magician, I'll be talking more about how we actually got here. My view is this, and I didn't invent this. People are doing work on this, and I will always credit them on this, okay? But when the earth was new, when the earth as it is was, shall we say, virginal, when it was ready to be mapped and landscaped and and, and terraformed and managed and, and, and used as very, very important, if not the most important planet in our solar system to manifest entities from other, and I don't mean... I don't mean aliens. See, this is where, this is where we have to be very clear. When you, when you're talking about, for example, the idea of astrology, let's say the idea of astrology, you're talking about the essence of Sagittarius. Sagittarius is a constellation. It's not an alien with white hair. It's a constellation with energy. Or we're talking about the essence of Virgo or the essence of Capricorn. All of these things come from these constellations which are huge and they are not individuals. However, as a, as a, as a collective, as a collective, the constellation has a signature and it has an energy and I would say it has a will. It has a part to play. If you have any connection to us, to astrology, you believe as I do that we are influenced by these energies all the time. And why wouldn't we be? In my view, why wouldn't we be? So there was a time when this earth source, I'm going to say source because still to this day, I have no better way to describe it. Maybe one day I will. Source allowed or encouraged or gave the go ahead to these energies to come to the earth. And this was midwifed by our seed race, which who, who were the fae, which is why I say the fae are not the fairy. Although we have learned a lot from debunking all of the crap that goes on oh, oh, goes on around the fairy. It's not the same thing. I'm not talking about the same thing, which I have been saying for years. However, once I started talking about the fae, everybody had to get on that bandwagon, Mike. Did you notice that there was just suddenly a renaissance of information about the fae? Everybody had to have something to say about it. Even Graham Hancock had something to say about it. Because if you were in the ancient civilizations business, you felt like you had to take a position on the Fae. Yeah. Okay. So I just let everybody run with that. And I just kept saying, you guys have no idea what I'm talking about yet. But okay, go ahead. It's I'm enjoying it too. Anyway, these are the Fae. I have said that the Fae were tasked with putting in the ley lines. And they were. And then I spent a year or so going and, and, because I didn't know where that went. How, why, what, where, who, how did that happen? What are you talking about? All I knew was I knew that the Fae had been tasked with lay, putting in the ley lines. A year after that, I came across somebody's research that put it all together for me, which was to say that the constella energy from the constellations generated domes, which is going to make everybody happy. I don't care what shape you think the, the earth is. That's going to make everybody happy. Domes of energy. And they covered the planet with various sizes and intensities of these domes of energy. And within the, within the context of these domes, you could access other dimensions. You could, this is where the uh, ley lines originated. You could pull the ley lines out of them. And in many, many cases, many, many cases, the Earth's response to a dome would be to raise a mountain. And so this is why we talk about holy mountains. A lot of people doing a work on this. I, this isn't my work. This is work I was gifted with. And I am so grateful because it put that all together for me. Not all of the areas with, with these, well, the whole Earth is covered with them. Don't get me wrong. There's not a square inch that doesn't have one of these domes. But they're not, the response wasn't always a mountain. 
I was off in a mountain. But the place on this planet that has the most power and the most amount of these little domes of energy that were given to us by by the universe, by the, the solar system, the galaxy, the universe, and, and is actually under serious military control, Mike, surprise, is Avebury in Wiltshire. Okay. Not a shock. The Avebury, all of those megaliths in that area, that is that is the center of power from these. Okay, let's just talk about I want to give you an example because, as I said, this can be very difficult to get your brain around. And believe it or not, it does go to food. I know I'm, 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 I am sailing this ship and the seas are high and mighty and rough, guys. I'm just trying to hang on. Okay. Let's just take an example. The Untersberg. All right. Which in my view is one of the most crazy, magical, sacred places on this planet. Very few people know about it. At the very top, there's a locus from which 12 ley lines radiate at down from the mountain. Yeah. Very typical. The locus of the ley lines where you raise hyperbolic towers of energy so that you can manifest. The Druids did it all the time. We used to do it all the time. We did it with our voices. We did it with this frequency, this resonance chamber that is our head. All right. That was the purpose of all of this. When I'm, Mike knows I'm pointing to my head, my nose, my cheeks, my mouth. You guys don't know that. My larynx, because it's a radio show. Anyway. That was the purpose of this resonance chamber, to manifest by frequency, by voice, by singing, if you will. There's a place near CERN where there are 26 ley lines that come together in a locus. CERN is sitting just about right on top of it. That's not an accident. But this is an also at the bottom of every, like around the Untersberg, at the bottom of the mountain, where each one of those 12 ley lines sits at the bottom of the mountain, sits a Catholic church right on top of it. Of course. Again, not a shock, right? Yeah. All right. So you have to understand, I think, before you can talk in any meaningful way about what's really going on with quote unquote food, you have to understand who we are, what we were when we got here, and what we're supposed to be doing. And how we, this is what I call the greatest con, really. The great food con. It is the greatest con. People have been um, coming toward this understanding for a long time. So what's our job? Our job, as I said, is to manifest by using this resonance chamber and frequencies to harness the energy of the earth to manifest on this planet. That was our job. And it was the arrival of, I would say, an adversary, which I have tried very hard to locate the the pinpoint the time when that happened. Um, I have there's an Irish uh there's an Irish tale that I'm absolutely obsessed with called the Battle of Moitura, which is a landing story. You have the Tuath de Danon on one side. You have the Fomorans landing from under the water or across the water. And you have these two entities battling. OK, I think that it's really important to understand that we have been broken to, to a great extent. Our abilities have been broken. How have they been broken? Well, one of the biggest ways that they've been broken is by the in, the idea that we have to eat our landscape, eat our creations, eat our fellow creatures, uh, trap creature. I mean, that we need that we are broken in some way, that we are lacking in some way, and that in order to survive, in order to keep going, we have to ingest our fellow entities on this planet. I, my postulate is that is not the case. That is not the case at all. This is something that also goes back uh, to 2014, and Mike probably has heard me say this or somebody else. We process 24,000 units of biophotonic energy every day. Now, it may have been at the time I first said that, that people thought I was a lunatic, but the reality is that was a university study I was quoting. Okay, and all kinds of universities have verified that now. This is mainstream science now. 24,000 units of biophotonic energy, meaning energy from the sun, courses through our body every day. That's been around now for about five years, that information uh, in, in our circles, and it doesn't even sound weird anymore. But the reality is that is what we use for sustenance. I was going to say eat. And that's just as good a word as anything else. But that's what we use for sustenance. And we transform that biophotonic energy. We make key. Okay. We have been convinced on this planet that 
key is there. And that if we are serene enough, if we are focused enough, if we are balanced enough, if we are Zen enough, zero enough, then we might be able to access this energy called key and live on it. Guess what, guys? That's backwards. That's absolutely the reverse of what the actual case is. We make that stuff. We make that stuff, it comes through us, it helps feed the planet, it helps feed the plants, it helps feed anything that lives lives and breeds and has a metabolism on this planet. We do that. We don't access that if we're good enough. I mean, it's why does everything have a religious connotation, Mike? Why is it every why is everything that got reversed on us over the millennia, 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 smack of this idea? That we're just not good enough to take to take part in what's around us, and that if we're good enough, we can. When in fact, we're the ones who are bringing it. I mean, it's just such a it's just such a crazy thing. Under no circumstances are we collectively to understand what our true capabilities are. So everything gets turned upside down. There you go. Okay, and one of the way I, I, because I know I, I mean Mike and I can talk all day and that's great, but he's you know I know we have a bit we are finite today, so I want to make sure I touch on a lot of these points. The points will go into depth at the lecture and even more depth in the book anyway. And I gave Mike the links to get to either one of those things. So or to get to me if you want to talk more about it, that's fine too. I'm totally accessible. In a nutshell, though, what has happened was there was a transition. There was a transition into toward which we went from being light beings to being feudal, feudal beings to being hostages to the earth. How did we become hostages to the earth? Grains. Somehow we became invested in this idea that we had to sow seeds in order to eat when that had absolutely never been the case before, okay? A feudal system grew up around this idea that we had to sow grains, and a certain portion of those grains went to the feudal masters, who then sold it back to us, by the way, so that we could eat it. So there is that transition. That transition is something that I'm going to be investigating at great lengths. How did I come to this? Well, for about five years, I'd studied this idea of of anedia, not eating. From I think that started in about, well, five years ago, about 2013, I started studying this idea of actually being able to live on light. This is not news, and no, I'm not new age, so please don't hang that one on me, but that is an actual fact. People who can, people can live on light. Of course they can. That was our original intent. What came first, your digestive system or food, or food? Were you born with a digestive system such that you needed to go out and find wheat, rice, grains to put inside yourself or was your digestive system a response to uh, something that was being pushed in your face okay I also talk very much about the destruction of this resonance chamber that is your head okay let me just ask you a question have you ever been told that you can't sing people have been telling children that forever my mom was a music teacher it used to make her insane because everybody can sing it's what we can do. It's what we do. We make that all that vibrate. We make all that vibrate. Well, singing, that's what our voice is. It's a its a frequency. Hundreds and hundreds of years of people telling you you can't sing. And, and it's just a lie. Everybody can make all of that vibrate. But think about that resonance chamber. It's not just the addition of grains to your body. The, the Taoists call it bigu, the five poisonous grains. You will hear me say grains kill, and I'm not kidding, okay? Uh, and soy, the soybean is actually pulled into that, to that grouping. Anyway, that's a Taoist um, concept, the grains kill. And that came along, I'm sorry, I'll get back to the resonance chamber in a second, but that came along between the transition from Taoism, Taoism, excuse me, to Confucianism. Confucius, or whoever he was, or was working with, or working for, he certainly was working for the the monarchy, the emperor in China, that level of society, those who would enslave you to make you grow their grains, talked about how before there was grain, there was nothing but starvation and there was a miserable life and every, you know, all of that. When in fact, the Taoists were talking about Eden. The Taoists were talking about Eden before grains, before the cultivation of grains came along. So you see there, there's a big line there that we're going to have to look into between one thing and another. In terms of your resonance chamber, let's talk about what's been done to that. 
First of all, you were told that you can't sing. Think about this idea of the witches around the cauldron. Okay, past, present, future, the Norns, Macbeth, all of that. Every Irish tale has these witches around a cauldron. The cauldron is your larynx. In in Macbeth, they spit into the cauldron. The cauldron is your larynx, and the witches are generating song, resonance, manifesting the past, the present, and the future. How do you do that? Well, you have sinus a sinus chamber that actually you're not born with. It actually develops as you grow. You have your lips. You have your larynx. You have your tongue. You have your uvula. You have all of these things, your adenoids, your tonsils. What have they been doing to your head in the 20th century? If they haven't destroyed this through a food addiction, which we're going to talk about in a second, they've been ripping all these organs out, right? Or telling you they don't matter or they don't know what they do. Tonsils are a big part of your ability to manifest, to make that resonance chamber be what it's supposed to be. So they just, they're trying very, very hard to destroy your ability, your resonance chamber to manifest, number one. And the, the wiliest thing that they ever did in the last two centuries was addict us via our tongue, our taste buds, right? And via our taste buds, the rest of our body. Now we talk about all the stuff that goes into our body that makes us ill. Now we talk about all the stuff that goes into our body that makes us fat. That's a new phenomenon. And there are armies of scientists out there working on better ways to addict your, addict your taste buds. I mean, people have been talking about that for a long time too. In Food Inc., remember that? Yeah. Um, all of these people have been working on this one particular aspect of The great food con, and that is addicting us to stuff that we have no business putting in our bodies. So the question becomes, do we have any business putting anything on our bodies? This is what I'm working on right now. And I'm not even going to approach the idea of whether or not we can turn all that off. But if you think about it, Mike, think about what would fall in our culture and everybody's culture if there were no food industry. What goes with the food industry? Well, pharmaceutical business would... Pharmaceutical business would Come crash. Come to its knees. Yeah, right. Yep. right? Every, um, 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 big agra. Supermarkets, big agra, yes. The uh, transportation industry. What would happen to the transportation industry? Would there be a need for it if we weren't shipping food around all the time? I get your point. The A huge piece of it would get yanked out because yeah. they are transporting food every which way from Sunday. Right. Any given day of the week. Right, right. And what about uh, what about garbage? Let's talk about garbage, trash. Right. Trash. Yeah. How much of trash is food related, even if it's throwing away paper plates, even if it's throwing away your old table, your old dining room table or your old this. Do you know, you see what I'm saying? Most everything, most everything, I think, in an industrial world hangs on the idea of the food industry. What I think that every bad intention out there would be brought down if we didn't have to deal with this idea of food. Now, usually when I'm talking about this right here is when I put in a proviso that I'm not talking about anorexia here, guys. I'm not talking about bulimia. I'm not talking about any of those sorts of things. This is a completely different category, and I don't want anybody to think I'm encouraging that. This is something altogether different, okay? This is simply about the idea that we don't need, okay, I'm just going to say it, we don't need food to exist on this planet, and it's done nothing but injure us, destroy us, and get in the way of our ability to do what we were supposed to do here. So are you saying, Kara, that basically sunlight is all that's needed? Sunlight is all that's needed. That's what I'm saying. And, of course, they're trying to get between us and the sunlight. Now, let's talk about the 20th century as well. I will, Like I said, I will be going into this deeper as we go along, maybe I can get Mike back after the book comes out after a while or whatever. But um, the idea is to briefly touch on all these subjects. Let's look at the cult of the foodie. Shall we look at the cult of the foodie from the 20th century? The chef, right? Yeah. Which sort of toward the end of the 19th century. But how did it really come into being? Who made food, a, turned food into a cult? Well, I think that was Julia Child. I think that was television and putting mastering the art of French cuisine on TV and, do you know, making it 
very sophisticated and very hip to be a foodie. That's, geez, that's still going on. There's that, and there's also the whole Norman Rockwell Thanksgiving dinner. This is your family. This is how you love your family. God Almighty, I fell for both of those hard. You know, I, I cook for my family, therefore I love them. Right. 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 Well, and then you had the advent of uh, the fast food restaurants that changed back in the 1960s. I remember when McDonald's first popped up. That piece of it, the fast food business, has been in place for what, 60 years? Yeah. 50, 60 years? Yeah. Yeah. And it's just getting worse and worse. Okay. So let's talk about this. I mean, you, you know, Julia Child's a fascinating character. She's a fascinating character. And uh, she did work for the. OSS, I don't know. I'm not making any claims there. I'm just saying. And then she was on television, and then we were talking about putting food in a whole different category. Plus, she looked like a guy in drag. She did. <laughs> she did, right? And yeah, so then she's on television, and she is convincing us that the very height of, of competency is to be able to master, master, that comes up a couple times, the art of French cooking, all right? That for me started, for me, that's a clear, a clear start of this role of the cult of the, of the foodie. Now, another thing that, that opened up a big aspect of this for me was there's another book that my son quite likes that just came out by an Iranian woman. Is it heat, salt, heat, fat, and acid? I don't know. Very popular book. You can see that on net, see it on Netflix. Go watch it. But when I saw the title of that series and that book, I thought, well, that's just alchemy. That's just in your face, man. They're just telling you. They're just telling you what they're doing. There used to be an internal alchemy, and there still is. We still have that uh, mechanism. Heat, salt, fat, and acid. Alchemy. All right? However, they've trained, they've taught us that we need to use alchemy on things outside ourselves, ingest them. I mean, when I say it like this, it sounds insane. Ingest them to complete ourselves again because we, because we're lacking that or, and we actually probably are lacking that now. But then the question becomes, how did that happen? How did that happen? Well, we became addicted to these substances. Perhaps our bodies stopped making them or stopped the processes in our body stopped working. They're still in there, but they're dormant. I think a lot of it has to do with our, the birthing process in the 20th century, where half of what we need to survive is left in the placenta and thrown away or sold to the uh, elites. So we are kind of lacking everything that we need now very much on purpose. This is a big subject. It's going to run from how we came here, what we were supposed to be doing, what happened to transition us to being sickly. There's a story of... Like I said, I'm obsessed with this Battle of Motora story. It's a, a, a bardic tale from Ireland in which the head doida, the head druid, was going walking to battle one day for this battle, waylaid by enemies in the other camp. And they said to him, if you can eat this huge vat of grain, we'll let you go. Otherwise, we're going to kill you, right? So he said, oh, I can do that. And in the story, he eats this huge vat of grain that then is actually mixed with animal parts and things like that. And then the head druid slept. In my view, what they're saying is the magic slept. For me, that's what that means. It's a very important story that I go back to again and again and again. So there is the ingestion of all these things that we're not supposed to be ingesting, which is not just Big Macs. It goes back to the dawn of time. And we have to understand that this is the great, greatest con, I think, that's ever been pulled on us. So, Carol, what if um, somebody has uh, suggested the, the idea or the thought that the reason why we have the food that we have versus, let's just say, sunlight, because I know the theory about all we need is sunlight, that people can actually survive off the sun. That it is a, um, it is a construct of the age that we're in. So the Greeks had the, the gold age, the silver, the bronze, and the iron age. There are those, I'm sure, that are listening to the show now that will say, yes, Kara's correct, mm -hmm. but the advent of not requiring food, eating animals, and all that stuff was really a, a component of 
a higher vibrating age, like the, the gold or the silver. And so in the Iron Age, that's when it got introduced, right? So where we're engaging in this type of diet, this type of eating and, and so on. But as the earth moves through its ages, we will then move back into higher realms of consciousness. And this type of eating will will go away. I, I'm just throwing that out there because I know there are folks that yeah. are going to think no, that. I mean, that's a good point. That's actually a very, very good point. And, and there are two things that to, to talk about with that one, which is what came first, the metabolism or the food. Right. You know, and actually, you're calling, are you talking about a de-evolution, you know, that didn't need to happen, that didn't need to take place, that wasn't natural? I think that's what we're talking about. Or are we talking about a natural evolution? And again, you've brought up alchemical principles, the uh, the metals as we went through the various evolutions of the of the earth, the planet, which is a real thing. OK. And the fact that we might be evolving back to the original state again, very, very salient point. I think that that's probably the case. I think that's probably why we're talking. We're being pushed to talk about this right now. Number one, there are all kinds of things all kinds of evolutions that we're hitting that we're going back to, they make people uncomfortable. I don't care. They do. We just have to understand that we are evolving back or that we're coming back to a state where we can be more completely who we are. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. We are evolving back to that state of not needing the, this food, but somebody has to say it, man. Somebody has to, has to put it out there. Or many, many people have to put it out there and make the case, make the case really well so that it enters the consciousness, the the group consciousness that's out there. Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, I was going to say that there are many things that I say that make people uncomfortable. And I don't mean that as a joke. I'm just saying that anytime I do a show on anything, whether I'm the host or the guest, there's going to be a boatload of people that are going to disagree. Some of them will be very, very animated and become angry yeah. about what they're hearing or what they're listening to and, and so on. There is a reason why we're having these discussions. And I do want to tell the audience this. For those of you that do get angry or you think this is silly and nonsense, whether it be this or anything else that I talk about on my shows, you have to understand that for every one person that feels that way, there's 10 other people that this resonates with. The consciousness of the masses is expanding. I could argue that maybe not at the rate and pace we would like it to, but it is. And that's why, Carol, like you said, these conversations and these discussions are being had. Yeah. So my little message here to anybody who's listening and thinks that, you know, we're crazy or nuts, whatever it may be, you have two choices. One, <laughs> turn the video off and go watch something that makes you more comfortable and happy. Mm -hmm. Or two, Continue to listen with an open mind and just take in some of what's being discussed here. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Those are really the two options. Mm -hmm. That's good. And also, you have to, whenever I do something new, you don't have to, but I, I invite you to <laughs> bear with me while I figure out how to talk about it for the first time, yeah. which is what Mike is allowing me to do. The first time you talk about something that is this radical, it's difficult to know how to talk about it. So this gives me the opportunity to lay it all out there and organize it vocally, manifest it with my larynx. It's a process of discovery. This is what I have said so many times on so many shows with so many topics is you know, people also want everything in a nice big box with a bow slapped on top of it. Right. Well, how come you don't know this? And how come you don't know that? And what about this? And what about that? Well, you know what? It's a process of discovery. We're still exploring. Right. And instead of nitpicking it, well, it would be helpful if maybe you put your thinking cap on yourself. Yeah, I'd love to hear some contributions. Exactly. Totally. And contribute, contribute in yeah. a positive way. Yeah. Even if you agree to disagree, do it in a positive way. It's welcome, you know. Right. So anyway, that's my little soapbox discussion for the show. Right. So I think there's just a couple of things I want to touch on again with you, Mike, with your indulgence. First of all, let's talk about this, the alchemical aspects of this. And the fact that that cookbook threw that right in my face, that this is, we're just talking about alchemy. And if you watch this woman, her name is Nozrat, Imran Nozrat, delightful young woman who is a chef. And clearly this is her, 
This is her saying. Um, at the very end of all of these uh, presentations, it's a documentary. She says, look, it's not about food. It's about everything else that goes along with food. It's about the people. It's about the community. It's about companionship. It's about all this stuff, which sounds really groovy and comfy and all of that. But think about that. That is a, that is what it's about. It is a tool. Food can be used as a tool. Food is used as a tool if we don't actually need food. And that's a radical way of thinking. OK, so when you're talking about alchemical processes in our body, OK, that this is what transforms the biophotonic energy to give sustenance to the planet around us and, and those on it. OK, you've got salt, fat, heat and acid. That's the name of that book. And that's these are the four main uh, components, if you will, of alchemy. I'm not pretending to be an expert. I just know that this is what makes sense to me. OK, salt. Let's talk about salt. There's also salt comes up a lot through history, through the Middle Ages. How do people uh, keep things so that they can eat them later? Right. This is about salt. As we go through food in the Middle Ages, we realize that the Catholic Church dictated when we could eat and what we could eat. That's just a fact. They didn't want you eating till after mass. All right. To begin with. Well, what is mass, Mike? Mass is a... Uh, it's a ritual. Well, it is a ritual, as are all of the things that surround eating, mealtime, okay? But it's also substance. Mass is substance, physically. They want to put mass in there before you eat. They want to put their stuff in there before you... Good point. Right? Okay, so there's a lot of rituals that go around breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's going to be in the lecture. That's going to be in the book, Okay. So alchemical processes within our body to transfer, transform that energy, salt, fat, heat, and acid. Salt cures meat so that we can eat it. Think about what I just said. Salt cures meat so we can eat it. Is meat sick? Why does it have to cure it? Why do we have to cure that before we can eat it? Good point. Salt is also part of the electromagnetic system of your body. Obviously, we all know that. We're, we're a saline based sea salt based unit walking around right but it, it you're the salt in your body enables the neural system the pulmonary system the joints and all that and can well the joints operate in conjunction with the fat by the way think about the fact that the magic protective circle is drawn with salt you know you put a, a circle around yourself protecting your the yourself as the magician and everything in it with salt Salt is the original organic crystal that's natural to us. When you replace salt with sugar, you have a problem. Sugar is not natural, not the, way, not the way we eat it. That's for damn sure. And you might remember Emily Moyer did a, did a fairly deep, radical piece of work on sugar as programmable matter. Yeah. Yeah. It's also a crystal. Okay. Salt versus sugar. So don't put sugar in your body if you, I mean, really. And anyway, entities, the entities that are that are trying to destroy us and keep us from manifesting as we are supposed to, you know, can't deal with the natural balance of salt in our system. So there's a huge drive to get us away from salt. I invite you to think about that from the 1960s onward. You're supposed to put the salt down, aren't you? Don't put any salt in your body, for God's sake. Well, certainly don't put the iodized table salt in your body. That's poison. But sea salt is not poison. Sea salt is very much what we are on the inside. Okay. All of the alternative salts that get mined and hacked and beaten to death, getting out of a mountain, those are, those are not really good. Only organic salt harvested from the ocean is good. Your amniotic fluid is what? Sea salt. Your blood is what? Sea salt. Okay. The artificially orchestrated scarcity or hollow that we can't fill, right? Like I said a minute ago, is probably because half of what we're supposed to have in us when we're born gets thrown away. All right, so that's salt. Salt is hugely important. There are people who say the Philosopher's Stone is just salt. That's all it is. All right. Heat. Let's talk about heat. What does heat do? Heat causes us to ascend. It rises. It speeds everything up. Right? Right. And it creates levity. Levity is very important. Levity is the opposite of gravity. That's what heat does. What does heat do in your body? Well, what do you do for your poor child when he's got a fever? 
you throw crap at it to stop the fever when the fever is what the kid needs. The heat to burn things out. That's an internal uh, alchemy, an internal alchem- alchemical process. Okay, let's talk about fat. I recently came across, and I want to say this because this was very, very exciting to me. There is a guy, and I know you're going to laugh because his name is actually Professor Peter Light. All right, Professor Peter Light. That's appropriate. I know, right? He's the chief investigator of the Light Lab at the University of Alberta. All right. And he has discovered, that's a simple way to put it, but that lab has discovered that fat has a a light receptor. Fat has a light receptor. All right. I mean, that alone is a chapter because you have to, you have to untangle all of that. They've been trying to get us fat free. They've been trying to get us low fat. What is fat? Fat is terrible. Don't eat fat. Right now we're all eating high fat, high protein diets because it seems to be better for us. And the medical community is going off its nut about that because it is better for us. Anyway, so sunlight on the skin and its influence on fat metabolism is another thing we're going to talk about. That is the alchem, that goes to the alchemy of heat in our bodies as well. I want to make you guys aware of that. I sent Mike the uh, link to that. It's a 20 minute video. What happens is I see stuff like that and I pull out what I need. The hard science is almost never what I need. (laughs) Almost never is the hard science what I need. But you'll be interested in that. There are light receptors in fat tissue. The ion channels, the fat tissue, as they apply to heat and the fat and work with the sun, they're talking about the melanopsin molecule, the post, this is interesting, Mike, the post-ganglionic retinal cells in your eyes have to do with the receptors of fat tissue. Having said that, what that brought to my mind is the pituitary gland. We talk about the pituitary gland and how it gets encrusted in all this garbage that we take in or the garbage that comes in through our eyes. But I know without a doubt that there are light receptors in the pituitary gland. How do I know that? Well, for most of my life, if there was a light on anywhere in the house, I knew it. And that's your pituitary gland. Do you know? Do you have that phenomenon? A lot of people, we all used to have that phenomenon, Mike. My mom did till the day she died. Okay, if there was a light on in the living room, she could have been 10 rooms away, and she knew it. Yeah. I'm just, as you're talking, I'm trying to think if um, I, I actually can't say that. You can't say that. <laughs> that's true. No, that I'm aware of a moment where, uh, specifically where I knew a light was on and I wasn't anywhere near that room. Well, now, so, now you'll be thinking about it. Now I will be thinking. Now you'll be thinking about it. That is your, that is, these are light receptors primarily in your pituitary gland. Okay. Anyway, so I want to turn, I want to direct people to that fellow's work because that excites me, this idea that fat has light receptors and how, how much of the food industry, how much of the nutrition industry, how much of the medical industry is aimed at dealing with fat. And how our bodies are collecting fat now in ridiculous ways, in unhealthy, weird ways. Why is that piling on? There's no reason for that to be piling on. Maybe it's because there's something between us and the sun. Yep. Um, do, do you know what I'm saying? I understand that this is completely radical stuff. I get that. And I know there's going to be some immediate flack. But the reality is they get, they get between us and the sun and our fat has light receptors. Something bad, something not natural, excuse me, something unnatural is going to start to happen. Well, they are trying to, I mean, they are, first of all, we know that they are blocking the sun. Right. That's the whole aerosol spraying program. And the other thing is how they continue to change the light sources that we have inside the house. Mm-hmm. Changing the light bulbs. Yes. And going LCD, um, all different types, mercury-based bulbs and stuff like that. Right. So I always found that quite interesting where um, they put it under the guise of energy saving, right? Everything's always about saving energy. I've always looked at it and said, why do they continue to alter the artificial light? Why do they continue to do that? Right. There's, there's a reason why they do that. Now, I haven't figured out – well, I can hypothesize what the reason is. is because do they're it. screwing with the light. There you go. Do well, it. They're just screwing with, they're screwing with the light <laughs> yeah. because th- these lights, especially like blue light as an example, affects you. It affects the human body. Mm-hmm. It affects like blue light at night. If you are exposed to that, you're going to have sleep problems. Uh-huh. Right? That's why 
I think that they're doing. And I think they're doing it as an ongoing program to keep the human body, the mind-body dynamic off balance. That's my my opinion, okay? It's not scientific in any way, but, you know, they have a reason for doing the things that they do. That's okay. If it was scientific, I would trust it far less, Mike. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm much more interested in what your intuition is, and yeah. I always will be. You trust your intuition. The science is something that was developed to, to justify uh, all the wrong turns and all the crap that shouldn't be, Yeah. which is why they can't figure it out. Science hasn't figured that out yet. Well, you know, I don't, I don't care. I don't want to hear about it. Do you know what I mean? I'd rather hear about people's intuition. It's like telling us there's no cure for cancer yet, <laughs> which is just right. unbelievable. Right? Yep. Anyway, I don't want to. Uh, uh, let's not go there. <laughs> we went we've gone there. <laughs> we'll go there again. Absolutely. We will go there again. But I mean, OK, so we said we talked about this, how we tell ourselves the truth. We tell ourselves the truth constantly by saying things like salt cures meat so that we can eat it. Can I ask for one thing? Here's here's one that just leapt out at me. Why are grains called pulses? Why are they called pulses? What's a pulse? This is a pulse. The pulse is your is your blood. Why are grains called pulses? I don't understand that one. I mean, I think that that's suspicious. This is this is the kind of thing that leaps out at me as suspicious. Why would they call them pulses? They are not pulses. Well, they do this all the time. It's basically word spell. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely word spell. And they're doing it to us instead of us, ha- you know, having our agency over our abilities, over who we are and what we can do. Right. So there came a time when we felt like there was that we were lacking. There came a time when we felt like we were lacking. And that was because of what we've been robbed of. And at that point, there was a gesture in the world, we think anyway, of thanking the victim uh, that we were getting ready to eat, the essence. We started trying to eat the essences around us to take them into our body. The essence of the antelope, the essence of what? The buffalo. Do you know where I'm going with this? We started trying, we started trying to incorporate the essence of those things around us because we felt because we didn't know because we felt like we no longer had that inside us. This is a Native American thing. I am not dissing Native American anything. I am. I, we all everybody in America is part Native American in some way. I mean, many of us are. That's not what I mean. But there came but there there came a point in the folklore of indigenous populations where we knew we were we were ingesting the essence of something because we felt like we didn't have it in us and there became this idea of thanking of thanking the animal that we just ate or the spirit of the animal that we just ate and honestly you could take that all the way to saying grace before a meal yeah you know thanking everything that's around you because you no longer have it within you the fact of the matter is you had it within you. You were never supposed to not have it within you. It was taken from you in the greatest con that ever hit this planet, which is food, in my view. Okay. So what came first, Mike, the digestive system or food? What do you think? Well, uh, that's a good question. I would think you would need the digestive system before you were able to um, to take in the food that we eat now, right? So that had to be developed first, I would think. This is all hypothetical, right? Um, because if you started eating the food without the digestive system, I don't see how that would work. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, it's an interesting question, isn't it? If, in it fact, your mouth, question. my view is your mouth, your sinuses, your whole head cavity, your larynx, your lungs – all of that is a resonance chamber for manifesting. Now, in, we, we also know that our bodies really don't digest anything, that there's gut flora, there's, there's bacteria in our gut that digest things. We don't digest anything that we don't, which is another big problem. So where did those come from? Were they, were we born with those? Were, did they enter our systems to save our lives, <laughs> to save us from what was getting shoved in our resonance chamber? I, I'm sure, you know, I'm well aware that people are going to think that I've gone off the deep end with this one, but it's, I haven't actually. 
It's complete. It's just seriously radical thinking. Think about that. People don't. This is okay. This is your scientific fact. You can verify this with your scientific buddies out there. We don't digest anything. The bacteria in our gut digests things. The living entities that live in our stomach digest what we put in there. We don't. Okay. We can't. We don't have the ability. Well, that's why some folks have to take probiotics in order to help with the digestive process. This is interesting. Uh, some folks might say, going back to what we were saying before, Kara, about the particular age that we're in, that you know, maybe the age in which we, uh, where sunlight was enough could be uh, an age where, most likely the gold age, I would say, where the body is maybe semi-etheric mm -hmm. in a way. Those are my thoughts. And that this current system that we're in, which we've been in for thousands of years, has really brought it down to the curb. <laughs> yeah. yes. Did you know yes. what I'm saying? Yes. It's as low as it can go type of thing. Absolutely. And, and not to get off on a diatribe here, but about two years ago, I guess it's about two years ago, that's when I stopped eating meat. Yeah. So I was like everybody else, you know, uh, well, most people. I was eating hamburgers and having steak and stuff like that and. And um, so to make a long story short, I, I watched a documentary about about two years ago. I don't remember the name of it. It was on YouTube, and I got about 15, 20 minutes into it. That was enough for me to just realize that it's wrong. Yeah. So as we're going through this, what I'm thinking, and, and you know, I'm not trying to uh, steal your thunder here. Oh, steal that, it. Do it. <laughs> no, no, because some of the audience might be saying, okay, well, you know, we're never going to go back to right now at this point in time to a point where – we are just taking in sunlight. I mean, right now I'm talking about, yeah. or that I'm not definitely not a semi etheric being. So what are you guys talking about? Like what are interim steps? So I think the interim steps would be to, to really start to pull back and, and assess and evaluate what you are putting into your yeah. body. Like right now, yes, in my view, I have to put something into my body in order to have, in order to live, right? Right. But it comes down to what are you putting into your body? Yeah. So it has to be done in an incremental way. You've got to step it down. Yeah. And you have to try to get back as close as you can back to basics. I'll, I'll just say that that's my little piece in case anybody was wondering like, well, how do you fill the gap in between just living off sunlight and the way we're eating now? Well, the way that you close the gap is you have to really start to evaluate and make choices, healthy choices about what it is you are putting into your body. Right. And then you have to reevaluate what healthy is. I mean, Mike makes a very, very, very good point because in, in saturating myself in this subject right now, what I've come to understand deeply is how addicted I am to so many things. You try to change, you try to change things and you understand that they really have you. You think you think your head is in, you think your head is just in the cell phone, dude? No, nope, that's not it at all. They have you like 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 the guy with the fava beans with the mask, that mask over your mouth. They've got you, you know, and they've got you hard. They've got you hard, not with anything that you need to survive, even in the most pedestrian analysis of what you need to survive as a human being. They got you. 99% of what you put in your body is strictly to keep you deeply, deeply addicted. Do you understand that? So if that's where we start with this, bravo, that's the place to start. I, I know that for myself. I mean, five years ago, all I really wanted to do was to be able to, to seriously, actively, purposefully tap into that light, light, uh, uh, eating. God, that sounds silly. The light resonance, the light processing, right? I wanted to be able to have, make a conscious decision to do that and do it. And, and however that transpired, I mean, I think the people out there who have been able to do that take decades, not weeks. They take decades to change their spirituality enough to be able to come close to that. That's what that's, that's what that's about. That's reality. It's not these gurus who tell you you can do it in a week. I would never recommend that kind of stuff, but, um, 
five years ago, I really wanted to be able to do that. And in the last five years, what I've understood, what I've come to understand is how profoundly uh, enslaved, how profoundly tethered, yoked to this food system I am. And I'm no different than anybody else out there. When you really start trying to analyze or, 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 or gain some agency and control over what you're putting in your body, then you know where you're at, man. As Mike says, that's where the rubber hits the road. It's one of those places where the rubber hits the road. And that's where we're at right now with this. And I really think that, I mean, I really want to do right now, my goal is to do a super good job of laying out the case so that everybody gets to a point where they're thinking about this radically and, uh, in a sovereign, in a sovereign way, you know, and also I agree with him. I, maybe I shouldn't say that you actually postulated that might, but in my view was that you said, what if this is a evolution yeah. back to where we need to be? I think that that is absolutely the case. I think that's absolutely the case. It's not the only thing either. I mean, I think that we were, um, what do I want to say? The, this is probably going to cause a lot of people's head to blow off and I don't want to really get into it, but, uh, this gender stuff, this not, not changing your gender, but this idea that you are non-binary, that you're both. Right. That's an evolution. In my view, I'm, I'm going to take it for this one, but in my view, I'm, I'm just convinced that that is an evolution because we've been that way in the past. We have. That's your science. Go look it up where we were self-contained and both of those things separating us into two things was probably not supposed to happen. And now we're headed back to this one thing where we are all, how can any new Asia, if, if that's what you are, not understand this idea of the all in one? Where we are self-contained, we are both of those things. We are all of those things. So there's a lot going on out there right now that people are acting like, well, that's one of them. People are acting like chimps throwing, throwing their own crap at you through the monkey bars, through the bars of their cages because they're scared. This kind of stuff scares them. Food is one of those things. We are, we are evolving, re-evolving. We are evolving back to a state where we should be, but we can't do that without understanding. I don't think we can do that without understanding how profoundly addicted we are. To that which they have used to enslave us. You know, going back to the, uh, the transgender piece of it, Kara, Martin Kenny and I actually talked about this in one of the shows yeah. that we did going back a few months ago. And it is a very, very combustible topic because when you try to lay it out the way you did, alchemically, they're looking for unification. Yes. Right? Yes. Now, what I'm going to say, and that's all I'm going to say about it, folks, okay, because this, this show is not about this, but if you understand the concept, theoretically, what Kara is talking about, fine, and then you're getting it. We're not saying the way it's going about is good or bad, the way it's being presented, okay? Right. We're talking about it from a much higher level. Right. A much higher level. If it's something that really bothers you for us to even have this discussion, then just let it go and move on. Right, right. Okay? We're not advocating anything. We're just saying when we talk about this type of stuff, this is what I do. I have to try to position myself to think in terms of what I refer to as the pyramid of power, the controllers. Yeah. What do the controllers do and how do the controllers think? And and I don't pretend to know everything about the controllers what they do, how they think, and all that stuff. But I try to invest my understanding in how they go about this. And everything that they do is embedded in the mystery religions. Uh, I'm going to say that. Yeah. And if you study the mystery religions, then this type of discussion about unification of the sexes and stuff like this becomes more understandable. And that's about as much as I'm going to say on it, because... There are going to be people right now that are screaming at their monitor and their speaker. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. I hope so. I hope so, Mike. That's all I'll say about it. I hope so. I need, I mean, I think that we need to, uh, when it comes to this kind of truly radical, in-depth thinking and discussion, we need to hit that nerve with people so that they really feel deeply about what we're saying. Okay, and before he's right, before we leave that one topic, 
because because I've been kind of following this in the in the social media and and things like that and my own my own knowledge of many many people who are who are engaged in this arena if you cannot if you cannot get with the idea of non-binary or um gender fluid you know gender fluidity or or those sorts of things that are being talked about right can i ask you from the bottom of my heart to not make it worse you don't have to support it but could you possibly not make it worse these people are trying to be very brave courageous talk about it okay some of them just you know you don't have to agree with it but just try not to make it worse you know what i mean for them that's that's my ask right now in that arena, but it's a very much the same kind of thing as coming as an evolution back to who we're supposed to be, the integrity of our physicality, our etheric body, our astral body, all of those things. One of the most one of the most insidious assaults, one of the most permanent assaults, was this introduction of what others labeled as food. Okay, food. Think about it. Think about yourself in relation to what you put in your mouth. Okay. Think about how you, how, how enslaved we are. Think about the monarchies that are kept going by the sweat of the toil of the people who are growing rice. I mean, it really does come down to that. It does come down to that. Peasants growing, I mean, farmers growing things. God bless the farmer, but because they think they're being, and they are in many ways being autonomous, they are, but actually they're a a bit of a slave to a system that's enslaving unless they're doing things just for themselves, which most people aren't. They have to sell a little bit of their extra to get a little money, right? Anyway, Mike, I'm going to do a lecture about this online in a couple weeks. I'll get more in depth with that. That's February 16th. Mike has all the information. If you want to, if you want to come to that, please do. Um, and then the book will come out in a couple of weeks and maybe give this a couple of months to, to, to sort of sink in, to hit, to hit the consciousness. Yeah. It. Let's think about this. Let's sleep on this for a couple months. And I promise you in a couple months, we'll have some deeper things to say about it. And thank you to Mike for giving me the opportunity to talk about this for the first time. Oh, anytime, Kara. Anytime. You know, this is better than talking about the same old, same old. Oh my old. God, Mike. Mike. <laughs> Just beating stuff into the ground. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna continue to try to wake people up about chemtrails anymore. Blah, blah, blah. No, no. We, we talked about this before the show started. And I, I may as well just repeat it a little bit here that Kara and I were talking and I had said that I don't view my job as being responsible for waking people up. The responsibility of waking up is on the individual, Right, is on each one of everyone who's listening to this, or even if you're not listening to this, everybody has a responsibility for themselves. What I do is I just put information out, either through my guests or if if I happen to be a guest on a topic that I'm talking about. That's it. Um, I'm not asking anybody to agree with me. If it resonates, fine. If it doesn't resonate, that's fine too, because at the end of the day, my life goes on. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I'm Absolutely. saying? Absolutely. You know, life as, goes on. As Mike and I are busy talk, walking or trying to walk our talk now. We're trying to walk our talk by populating our lives with activities that bear witness to what we're trying to say. And we're not being all vocal about that. We're just getting our, we're just doing it. Right. And, and part of that doing it is living your life. Yeah. And having quality time with your family yep. and your friends, yep. okay? Whether they're awake or not awake is irrelevant. Like I said, everybody has their own rate and pace. They're here for whatever it is they're here to learn. But that's a big piece of of living here. And if you're going to invest all of your time in negative stuff, dark stuff, then what's going to happen is you are going to sub-optimize your own life. You're going to sub-optimize your own happiness. Right. So you have to strike a balance. There is a balance to looking at conspiracy or or digging into alternative research and enjoying why you're here. That's right. That's right. You know? Otherwise, they win, dude. They win. Exactly. And that's the last thing exactly. I want to have happen. Right. That's exactly right. right. So I spent, so. yeah, I spent uh, 
six years traveling and talking about my books and writing new books and trying to get people to bums in seats to listen to what I had to say. And then I said, you know what? I can do that. I'm going home to my kids. I need my family. I love my family. I need my family. And it's time to just put all this stuff into practice. Let everybody, let other people pick up the, the hue and cry that happens when you first discover something that's always going on. Right. Right. Now I just, now I just want to live my life the way I said it should be lived. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Um, I was having a conversation uh, with Barry and uh, I was talking about Sometimes you get to the point where you, you think to yourself, how much further can I take this? How much more of this is really something I want to do? Because I've been doing it a long time, you know? Yeah. And there's that part of you that says, oh, if I don't continue to do it, am I coming up short? Yeah. Am I failing? Yeah. And, uh, you know, she gave me a shot of reality. And she says, Mike, how long have you been doing it? I said, well, the blog, you know, eight years or so, seven or eight years. Yeah. And I said, the radio show is five years now or something. Right. And she says, you've paid your dues. Yeah, exactly. You've put enough content out there. You've, you've done what it is that you felt you needed to do. And at some point, you decide that you're going to go do something else because that's where your heart takes you. Yep. Do it. Then you do it. You do it. You do that's it. That's right. You know? Exactly. So, yeah. So if I sound like I've mellowed out a little bit, folks, it's because I have mellowed out a little bit. <laughs> well, you just have to understand. I mean, and this is another thing Mike and I have been talking about off and on for a good year is what is our place in this community? What is this community for? Uh, where do we put our energy? How, how much good is that doing? I mean, you know, these are things if you don't, these are self, this is self-reflection. And if you don't self-reflect, then you're just a narcissist and you're just out there for the attention. And neither one of us is, is neither one of us is out there for that. So no, I, I'm not interested in attention. And in fact, I'm a very private person. And uh, and people might find that kind of weird. It's like, well, you do a radio show and you're a private person. Yeah, you could do a radio show and still be a private person. Yeah, but that's because you're being driven to talk about something that you know you have to talk about. It's really that simple. Exactly. And then when you hang up the the headphones and you put the microphone away, you're doing you're living life. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm going to go do? I'm going to go dig my car out from under the snow, and I'm going <laughs> to kiss it on its hood for starting yeah. in the in the middle of this ice storm, okay? That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> what I'm going to do is go take the dog for a there walk. You go. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. You're the best. You're welcome, Kara. You're welcome. Anytime you know, and uh, I'll have the show out as quickly as I okay. can. Okay. Sounds good to me, and I'll you'll probably end up with a PDF of the book. Okay. Thank you. Well, you know, you're, you're, you're like my, uh, what is it that, uh, dead man switch stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, Mike's got a copy of it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If anything happens to me. All right. Hi to everybody. All right. All right. All right Carol. Bye. All righty. Bye bye. And that concludes another Sage Akoi interview. And I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the description box below. And as always, I would like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can find all my social media and web links by visiting my hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to check out my music and album releases. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone with the next show. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.